of the Radnor Conservancy. Uh, tonight's presentation is another in our sustainability series, which is co-sponsored by the Radnor Conservancy and the uh, Township EAC. Uh, my thanks to the Township and the EAC for helping us uh, put together tonight's program. Uh, first, a little housekeeping. I think everybody has signed in. If you have not signed in, uh, there are two lists. If we already have your name on the Conservancy email distribution list, you don't have to sign that list. Uh, but the other list is uh, from Seesaw, uh, which is the agency that's providing the funding for tonight's program. And they've asked that we uh, keep strict attendance uh, because they like to know who benefits from their programs. Stormwater management is a growing concern in Radnor. Uh, Multi-year storms seem to be occurring with greater frequency sometimes resulting in serious flooding in parts of the township. The problem is made worse by the number of streams which crisscross Radnor and by the uh, heavy concentration of impervious surfaces in our commercial areas. The township is considering several potential solutions to this problem. Although these, what I'll call macro solutions, are absolutely necessary, they will be expensive. Tonight, we're going to focus on micro solutions. What can each homeowner and business owner in Radnor do to help ameliorate this problem? Even if your property sits on the top of a hill and is never flooded, the impervious surfaces on your property are contributing to the problem downstream. There are many steps we as members of this community can take to help deal with this stormwater problem. Tonight's presenter is Vivian Williams, Educational Program Manager and Program Design Specialist at the Stroud Water Research Center, one of the most preeminent freshwater research facilities in the country. Vivian has her bachelor's degree from your Sinus College and has done graduate work in environmental science at the University of Delaware, Towson University, and Goucher College. Vivian is an educational consultant to the Philadelphia Water Department and to PAC Grant. She teaches widely about watersheds and specifically stream ecosystem function. Uh, before turning the mic over to Vivian, uh, a word about the format of tonight's program. Vivian's presentation will last 40 to 45 minutes. After her presentation, we will open up the floor to uh, questions. Uh, so please hold your questions until after Vivian has completed her presentation. Um, after the end of the formal program, Vivian will stick around for a few minutes, I believe you've agreed to do this, to talk to people about any specific issues you might have uh, concerning your own property. So during the Q&A, please do not ask any questions which are really specific to your personal property. And I'm now pleased to introduce Vivian Williams. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for having me here tonight. And um, I guess we can begin. And so we need a little um, storm in the background. Um, Bob. <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and hope that the sound is going to work. Let's see if we can get it to work. Um, okay, well, imagine that there's a storm <laughs> going on back there in terms of the sound. Um, okay, so um, John was tell saying that we all live, you know, we all live upstream. You keep hearing about we all live downstream, but we all live upstream as well. And traditionally, all the kind of um, the macro solutions and you know you see all these um, the, the mall stores and they have the detention basins and they're all at the bottom you know some low area and and so some of that does solve some problems but basically the theme of tonight is that you know you really want to deal with water where it actually rains where it actually falls and so I'm going to begin by saying something about the problems, um, which you've heard a little bit about, and you're probably all very savvy about. 
um, and then we're going to get to the solutions. So when it rains, where will it drain? And it's, so, it's very obvious that we, if we colored in all the impervious surfaces in, in this um, rather pixelated overview, um, there's an awful lot between roofs and roads and driveways. There has, you know, as, as development occurs, there's just more and more impervious surfaces. Where, where is that water possibly going to go? Well, um, downstream, Upper Darby, of course, Darby and Cobbs unite to, you know, kind of close to the Delaware, and uh, this was in 2004. Um, so again, with all those impervious surfaces, any low-lying area very easily gets flooded. And so if you think about, you know, the, the destination of rain, much of that, you know, will fall on the roof and then go towards the road and then go to, towards the storm drain and then go towards the river in many cases. And sometimes in, um, if there are some faulty laterals, they will, even in Radnor, they can possibly even get into some of the sewer system pipes and then you have the, the, the uh, wastewater treatment plants have a huge problem dealing with more water they can handle. That's a huge problem in Philadelphia. And later on in the talk, I am going to talk uh, quite a bit about Philadelphia because there's an awful lot happening there. Um, there's an old infrastructure um, and again, Radnor Media, a lot of these towns have a rather old infrastructure. And with, with Philadelphia, they have combined sewers and the sewers just can't handle of all that water, so a lot of it has to get shunted out to the river. And of course, the tap, we all drink surface water or well water. Um, so that's, that's usually the hook that gets people very interested um, in storm water, any kind of water issue. Um, you can always, if you talk about recreation and or if you talk about drinking water, that is usually what will get people who don't really care too much about stream ecology will get them very interested in the subject. So really what we're concerned about is water qua um, quantity, which is the overriding issue usually in municipalities, um, but of course we're also very interested in water quality. So anything running off all of those surfaces is going to pick up all kinds of pollutants and make their way to our stream systems. So if we look at the Darby Cobbs watershed, um, you can see there's, you know, there's all these wonderful little tributaries that go, that um, connect to, to the Darby and, of course, on the Philadelphia side at Cobbs, and it drains into the Delaware. And if we look a little closer, we see Radnor truly is upstream. You know, you are kind of at the headwaters there of Ethan Creek, and if you, um, I don't have a, a laser pointer, but if you look at the boundary lines, there's lots of boundary lines there. And you can see, you know, in that sort of tan colored boundary line, um, that's the watershed. And over on the other side, then you're working, you're going into another watershed. And if you look at the major roads, it's kind of interesting because many of them follow the ridge lines. So Lancaster Avenue, for example, is very close to that border. And if you look at maps, it's, it's, you can see that very, very often. I know um, 252, I, close to where I live, is along kind of a ridge line and sort of separates two watersheds. So again, it's, it's kind of interesting to see that. And on the bottom, you can, you can kind of see that. I guess that's Westchester Pike, I'm assuming. Um, so you've got Ethan, and actually now I should say, um, these next couple of slides I took right from, your, for, from the Radnor Township website. Um, so there's some lots and lots of information at the end of this program. I'll, I'll give you some websites that, um, if you want some further information. But um, you can see there are four uh, river, you know, streams that, that um, crossed Radnor Township. And you can also see there's a 300 foot difference in terms of elevation in Radnor. And so you've, we've got a lot of water here in, in this area. And so I'm just going to go over some of the major issues that really have changed over time, and that's why we're having such enormous problems with stormwater. And one of them are changing weather patterns. I heard um, not too long ago that we we're going to become the, the new Northwest. 
So if we get all the great little coffee shops and everything that goes with the, the Northwest, there'll be a lot of nice things associated with that. But we, we are going to be, it seems that if we continue with this patterning, we're going to be getting a, more and more water. Um, and we were already pretty water rich to begin with. And the thing is that these smaller storms now have a greater intensity. And that is making a huge difference in terms of how do we handle all that water. And of course, that is affecting the stream system and how they can handle that water and particularly what that does to, to water quality. So again, it's those two, water quality and water quantity. The, the uh, floodplains have been, have been built on um, in the past. And so streams have been rerouted, streams have been buried and been put in culverts, and so they can't act the way they naturally would to deal with water. And so again, that if you, if you build in a floodplain, if you build on a, you know, a coastal <laughs> plain, you, you're bound to get flooded sooner or later. And of course, as more building occurs, that's what's happening. And then of course, there's the aging infrastructure. Um, we've got a lot of old pipes, we've got, we, we, and again, they can't deal with all the water from all the development that has occurred. And these management practices really didn't happen until, um, until the, the 70s. So that's when people started taking notice and they started getting, you know, ordinances started get, getting on the books. Um, but at that point, you know, a lot of the so-called damage was done. The real, so we're dealing with, with what's happened, you know, where regulations weren't in place for a long time. So it, now we're going to be on the upbeat here and we're going to talk about some of the solutions. Um, and so just again, you probably are, are all fairly much aware of this, but I'm going to talk about the importance of vegetation pretty much for the rest of the program. That's going to be incorporated in almost everything I say, and trees in particular. And after Sandy, the hurricane, you may not be, you may think trees may not be the answer to everything, but um, if trees are extremely important to water, um, to water quality and to stream function. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the the things about trees that people don't usually think about that have to do with water quality. You think about the roots holding banks, for example. You think about the leaves creating shade. You might think about the leaves feeding some of the organisms that are in streams if you're thinking about stream systems. But actually, the reason, one of the major reasons why vegetation and trees in particular are so important to our water ways is because they create this fabulous soil structure. So if you think of the soil as this wonderful sponge, and if you've walked through the woods and you were going to describe that soil, it's dark and it's rich and it's loamy. And again, if you can imagine a small sponge and you're pour, pouring dirty water into that little tiny thin sponge, that might filter out a little bit, but then that water is going to run off, especially if you compact it. But if you've got this really deep, rich, wonderful soil structure that comes from the leaves that are decaying, all that decomposition from branches and leaves, you get this just incredible sponge. And that's extremely important. And I'll show you an image, a diagram of why it's so important. Because water, when it rains, then can infiltrate. And that, that sponge, that soily, that, that, that sponge soil is holding water. It's our storage tank of fresh water, but it's also filtering it. And that's not intuitive, especially when we're with kids. If you pour water through dirt, and of course you never treat your soil like dirt, but you know, you'd think, oh, it comes out dirty. That is not the case. It's just the, the opposite. You have a wonderful deep soil. That water will, will go through there, and all these little microorganisms and macroorganisms are gobbling all the stuff that's in the soil, and as it works its way down, by the time it gets to your water table, that water is clean. That has been filtered, and it's been transformed. So that's a really important thing to understand. The other thing is that vegetation, and trees in particular, slow water down. So if you have a heavy rainstorm, you know, and you've got an open field, it's compacting that field, that, that ground. 
But if it's hitting the leaves and it's traveling down the, the branches and working its way down the trunk, that's called stem flow. And so by the time it gets to the ground, it kind of very gently gets into the ground and can percolate through and infiltrate. So it's that combination of the soil structure and slowing that water down that's in a lot of the features that you see in terms of sort of the remedies of how you deal with stormwater. And just as a, a quick diagram, in our part of the, uh, the world, in our part, uh, part of the country, when it, you know, our streams are fed by groundwater. Um, so so if, if, there's, if you shut that, that system off where you cover over the ground, that water can't infiltrate, it's just gonna run off into the stream. Um, and that's gonna change how much water you have in the stream, it's gonna change the base flow. So a lot of our streams now have a, a much lower base flow when it's not raining because it hasn't been able to filter down into the ground. So again, if you think of the ground as a storage tank of fresh water, that's important. The other important thing to remember is that vegetation, you know, not, it, it, it takes up water and then a lot of that leaves the plants as vapor. So again, that's kind of a cleaning process. Um, and about 40% in a forested area, um, about 40% often, of course it depends on, on the forest, is actually is, is, um, transpired, is, is, um, is a vapor that's given off by the plants. So again, that water is, is cycling through plants and then back into the, to the air. So now I'm gonna say a little bit about Philadelphia because we're kind of in a unique situation right now. Philadelphia is gonna spend over $2 billion in the next 25 years to green up the city. It will be one of the greenest cities, if not the greenest city in the country. And the reason for that is they have over 6,000 miles of pipes. If you think of their drinking water pipes and their wastewater treatment pipes, and it's a very old infrastructure. And there is no way that they can handle, can deal with, with redoing those pipes. And a lot of them have, you know, are cracked and leak, leaking. And so they have to go to an, a, an, another way of dealing with all the storm water from all these impervious surfaces in, in the city. And the way to do it is to green it up. And they're spending, uh, as I say, over $2 billion to do that. And so this illustration um, kind of shows you, if you look very carefully, you can see you know, the stormwater planters and the rain barrels and the rain gardens and the pervious pavement and the flow through planter and the green roof. And so we're gonna cover, I'll show you some, uh, some images of a variety of these strategies for dealing with stormwater. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually show you a video and we'll see how, how well I do this here. Uh, Green City Clean Waters is an approach to how we deal with our combined sewage overflow issue and our stormwater management issues in a really innovative and green way. We have been the first city to really say to the EPA and the DEP that we're going to make our rivers and streams fishable, swimmable, beautiful again by really pushing the green approach. The idea is designing a landscape that can help absorb that rainfall. We want to keep it on site as a resource and it's part of a natural system. The idea is to get the water from the downspout to just slow down. This water used to go into the city sewer system and in really heavy rainstorms it would overflow into the creek. Schools are centers of community, so what better place to manage stormwater but also create learning landscapes and tying it back to the curriculum. Who wants to guess this one? It brings an outdoor classroom for students. It sort of engages in a different way and cements it in the brain in a different way. What 
we're trying to do with these green infrastructure is to allow water that is running off of the streets and sidewalks to be managed in a more sustainable way. Detained until the peak of the storm has passed and released back into the system, but at a rate at which the system can handle it without overflowing. Green solutions to solving the stormwater problem don't just solve stormwater. They create parks, they create shade, they create beauty. It makes me feel happy to come home and see plants and your neighborhood clean. People still care about their communities and what it looks like. It has to be about collaborations, it has to be about partnership, it has to be about aligning investments. We work very, very closely with the state, the federal government, community groups and nonprofits. Hi there, how are you? It's about leveraging resources and how we manage land, how we sustain the city of Philadelphia economically and ecologically into the future. This is a quintessential community enterprise. It's really all about the culture, vision, capacity to stick with a long-range, multi-administration, multi-generational program that has a vision for what a city can be. Again, I had, I had warned you I was going to be talking about vegetation a lot um, throughout this, and I think the, the whole, the, the name that they came up with, um, green, green City Clean Waters, um, is, is, a, is a great one. Now, you, you know, you may not want to turn your yard into an edible estate, <laughs> but um, again, just taking grass, which, you know, I, I like some lawn too. I like to play bocce ball occasionally and croquet, so it doesn't mean that you have to take every, you know, inch of your property. But grass is not terrific in terms of runoff, usually. You know, if you had prairie grass, that would be a little different. They have nice deep roots. But, you know, mowed grass, it compacts the soil. So, again, if you can have vegetation around your grassy areas and cre create kind of islands you know, maybe around your trees of uh, vegetation. Um, that's, you know, that's a great strategy for dealing with getting the water into the ground. I'm going to talk about redirecting your downspout now. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about harvesting rain as well. Um, there is a rain barrel at the back of the, uh, the room here um, that I invite you later to take a look at. Um, it's, it's very artistic and very lovely, and I am going to probably talk the most about rain barrels, actually, in this talk, because I was involved in a big project in media. So you can see that the, you know, when you've got a rain gutter that's going right onto your driveway, um, that's, you're going to have runoff. So if you can redirect it and get it into your garden in some way, that's great. Um, and if you've probably all heard about rain gardens, and so they, generally speaking, I have heard that it's better to have several small rain gardens than one huge rain garden. And oftentimes you can have, you know, various level layers of gravel and all kinds of wonderful soil and compost. Basically, you're building that soil structure that would be in the forest. I mean, that's what we're again we're imitating what happens in, in a forested area, basically. Um, so you're creating great soil, and then you're pl planting in an area where water can you know, kind of collect, but then also work its way through the soil so it's not actually sitting in there. So it's not a detention base as such. And um, media, right at our borough hall, which actually we have a number of demonstration um, projects that show how to work with stormwater. And so this was, you know, just dug out and, and the great soil put in. It was very simple. It was just, it's this little rain garden. It's doing really well and it's capturing a lot more rain than it 
captured before. We have two little ones, actually, that are on either side of the building right by Borough Hall. Um, and again, um, they, are, they can be very lovely and they definitely do a lot of good work in keeping that water from running down the street. So why redirect a uh, downspout into a rain barrel? Well, of course, the main reason is that it's great in the summertime because you've got this, this nice container of, of water that you can you know, go to when you do have dry times. It's also chlorine-free, so that's, that's good for all the little organisms in the soil if you have a vegetable garden. Um, and of course, it saves you money. But the main thing is it just saves thousands of gallons of water during the summer. And now you have an amazing assortment to choose from in terms of styles because when back even five years ago, there was no choice basically in rain barrels. They were, you know, if you got some that were, you know, had olives in them <laughs> or vanilla in them, they were like this electric blue or they were just incredible colors and people often thought they were really ugly but they worked and that was what was available and you could, you know, there were some that you could buy, but it was really hard. And it is incredible to me how over just this very short time, there's now an amazing assortment. So I thought this wasn't bad looking. You can even put flowers on top of it. This is a little, this is a house in media that was on our eco tour and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then you can see on where it says rain barrel diverter on the bottom, there's actually just a little tube so you have a choice. And I'll show you another kind of diverter. So if you want the water to go into your rain barrel, it can in, in the winter or if you're away for a long time, you can just very easily divert that back down into your downspout and away from your house and into a garden, hopefully. Um, and there, you know, all kinds of adapters. So even if you know it seems un, you know, hard to position your rain barrel, you can pretty much get any kind of attachment that will make it work. And by the way, that was the electric blue I was talking about. That was our original rain barrel. We have given that to somebody else now. We have different ones. And then of course, where you put the hose, obviously it, the ideal is to have your rain barrel positioned so that it, you can have a hose that will go into a garden. So we're back to, you need vegetation, you need something where that water can drain to. And so a soaker hose works really well if you have a garden that's, that's close by or just a nice unkinking hose that will work if it, your garden is a little bit away from your rain barrel. The project that I was involved with was extremely rewarding, so I want to talk a little bit about that. So this was before we had all the choices for rain barrels. So I actually, one of my proudest moments, I, I drove a Penske truck um, back from Pittsburgh. I, there is a the Nine Mile um, Run um, Watershed Association actually patented a design, and it's basically a big trash can, but it's 130. Um, gallons. It holds 130 gallons. And my one critique of many of the giveaway barrels that different programs have is that they're way too small. Any, you know, I have two big ones. I have these two of these 130 gallon barrels and they fill up almost immediately. So if you decide to be involved in any kind of a program where you give away rain barrels or sell rain barrels, try to get the largest you can, short of a cistern, or you know, um, because really they fill up very, very quickly. We so I was working with three schools in media, and they actually designed part of their art class was to design um, around a theme of gardens. Actually, was um, one of the themes. Um, and then the, the students used a variety of media. Um, Providence Friends School painted their barrels. This was a winter project, so I was really worried about paint and volatile oils that come from paint. Um, because if you wanted to stick to plastic, you need something that usually is very aromatic, and I was concerned about the kids' health. So there was a big open space at Media Friends where they could do that. But Media Elementary School, 
um, didn't have that. So I found a contact paper, and actually I'll show you on the, it's, uh, it's a, that was out, it's like signage paper that works just like contact paper. And I still have a design on mine from like five years ago that is, is out all winter. It is amazing how this stuff sticks. And it was also great as for school project because kids could work in teams and they could, you know, do designs and kind of little bits and pieces they could piece together. And so um, they just turned out great. And then they kept some barrels and they gave the rest to the municipality. So they're at the library, they're at the uh, they're at Borough Hall, they're at the fire station, they're all around town. And if anybody, how many of you, I'm just curious, and I know they're not going to be happy because the, the, the camera can't see you, but I can't help it. Um, how many of you have rain barrels? Do any of you have rain barrels? Okay, a lot of you do. Well, you know, there are a lot of hands that were raised for the sake of the, the uh, video. Um, it's the inertia, it's just to get it attached in the beginning, you know, because so many people get barrels and then they end up in their garage for several years. But, you know, it, then once you get the momentum going and you can get it attached, they're great. And I'm sure those of you who have it are really happy that you have them and you use them. So we had a lull uh, at media elementary school for about a year before they actually got attached. But then they did. And from that, what the next step was they created a garden for the kids. So it was, I feel really good because it was kind of sm snowball reaction. Um, so now they have vegetable gardens and they feature a vegetable every week in the cafeteria. And over the summer, kids adopt these gardens, a family, and they can pick the produce from it. So it's become this whole thing and, you know, they use the rain barrels for that. So that was very satisfying. And in, in, um, in New York City, I think it's really cool for, for um, some of these community gardens. They actually built structure that is a roof that, <laughs> so that their rain barrel can capture rain. So um, there are all kinds of different strategies, again, for, for utilizing, for harvesting um, rain and, and having it as a resource instead of as a problem. There are perceived negatives. Um, one of them, again, is this sort of, you have to saw the downspout, <laughs> um, and that's probably the biggest thing that sort of causes inertia. Um, but once you've got that, you know, then you're good to go. Um, also, mosquitoes, are, I always get questions about mosquitoes. And you can get dunks. It depends, they're sort of, open, there are a variety of styles. So if you've, you've got um, an attachment that goes right into the barrel, and you don't have a, concave top where water's going to collect. You shouldn't have too much of a problem. It's more where it's have the sort of where it, the barrel is sited. So if you, it's, there's good drainage and you've got it on level ground and there's gravel underneath and you don't have puddling, you shouldn't have too much of a problem. But there are dunks that you can get. Then other people worry about winterizing your barrel. And, and again, if you have a diverter, and I'll show you an image of that in just a minute, um, and your barrel is, is a hardy barrel, it can just stay out and you can just divert it. Or you detach, you know, in the winter, you detach the spout from it and then attach it again in the spring. And finally, people say, but, you know, what's one barrel? You know, how much water can they actually collect? But look at all of you. I mean, all of you, so many of you have barrels. That makes a huge difference. If every, you know, if more and more people get barrels and, har and use that water, um, and get that into the, you know, into their gardens, that will make an enormous difference. And here's an image. This, by the way, this um, barrel is at our at Media Library. So if you go to Media Library, you will see this, this barrel, and there's a diverter on it. So again, just with a little lever. There are different kinds of diverters. So again, for winter, you just move the little lever, and then you don't have to worry about water running into the barrel. So they don't have to detach it. And of course, uh, years and years ago, everybody had rain barrels. Farms had rain barrels. And I don't know if all of you know the, the song, shut down my rain barrel, slide down my cellar door, and we'll be jolly friends forevermore. If you're as old as I am, you'll, that might ring a bell. But um, I think it's kind of interesting to, to reflect that Bermuda, um, they don't have fresh water. They have to collect rainwater and their roofs are especially designed to collect rainwater and they have big cisterns 
in their basement, and that's the water they drink. So, um, again, all kinds of possibilities for, for collecting water. The other thing, when we talked about stem flow before, our rain chains are becoming a new th thing. I don't know if you've seen those rain chains. We have some beautiful ones at Stroud. We have a new building, and I have a picture at the photograph at the end to show you our new facility. But um, they slow water down, and they're very attractive. So again, another kind of decorative strategy. You've probably all heard of green roofs. Um, and of course, they're heavy. So the problem is you can't just say, oh, I really decide I want to put a green roof on my house. You really have to have the structures to support it. But you know, some roofs possibly can be retrofitted for it. And new structures, of course, um, that, that is an important option that is happening all over Philadelphia. This is the Pico building in Philadelphia. And um, it, it's the largest um, roof garden in Pennsylvania. It's 45,000 uh, square feet. And you can visit it. They give tours of it. And the Philadelphia, or, um, Penn, uh, Philadelphia Horticultural Society um, do, maintains some of the gardens. Sedum, sedums are usually what's used on roof gardens, but you need very hardy plants that in, you know, will go throughout the year and can take drought conditions as well as rain. So um, it, it has made a huge difference. At least 60% of rain is captured, at least. That is the minimum. In the summer, it's more. And um, in, in terms of temperature, it, it makes a huge difference. I, I just found it fascinating to think that a roof can get to 150 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the summer. And so it de definitely does is very important in terms of energy. And like so many things, like solar panels and geothermal, it's expensive to do initially, but it pays for itself over time because it lasts a lot longer. And Swarthmore College, many of the universities now have them, colleges have them. I know Penn State has green roof. Um, so they're, they're becoming more and more common. And Stroud Water Research Center, our new building, has a green roof as well. So just to, to take a look at the, the structure, and now you can get them in little sort of, um, sort of pieces that you can kind of put together as a, a puzzle in there. Um, so this is the, the various layers that it takes. There are also green walls. And I did read something that I found fascinating. I have always heard that ivy growing up a building is a terrible thing because it holds moisture and it's you know, supposed to do all kinds of damage to your walls. And I think it was a New York uh, Times, Science Times. They had a whole article. They did some kind of study. I believe it was somewhere in England. But they actually found that ivy is great for your walls. <laughs> it actually protects it from the, vari the variation of temperatures, like from you know winter to summer, and it keeps just more even temperatures. Now, so that goes against everything I ever heard. But y the green walls that I'm talking about actually are almost like the green roofs. They're separate sort of structures that can be put on the wall. But now I'm starting to think maybe ivy. I mean, I'm, I'd like to see some other studies. But there was, it was in the Science Times. So at least one study has said that uh, it's great to have all that stuff growing up on your walls. Philadelphia has actually a uh, wall. They create wall gardens called Urban Jungle in, in the Passyunk area. So I think that's kind of exciting. Then there are pervious pavers. And the, the, picture, the image of the car on it was actually taken in Italy before there was, was a lot of pervious paving um, interest, in, um, at least that I was aware of in this country. It, Percy Street in Philadelphia is a pervious street. It's almost like a little alleyway. They started with a small street, and they're, they're testing it, and they're seeing how it works. Um, so, we do have a whole street now that is pervious. But a homeowner can do all kinds of things um, in terms of you know where you park your car or in terms of walkways. Um, there are, again, all kinds of things you can do to try to get that water in the ground, whether it's gravel or it's mulch, um, as opposed to concrete. And of course, there are now 
pervious concretes and asphalts and a lot of parking lots and nature centers and universities are pervious. Philadelphia also has a lot of flow through planters. Now this is a little bit more, you know, maybe than what a homeowner might do, but in terms of the municipality, one of the things that might be nice to see in this beautiful space that we have here, this beautiful building, and I would be to have all kinds of demonstration projects on the site, and I don't, maybe there are projects that I'm unaware of, but I think that would be something I would really encourage. So um, we had a media neighborhood eco tour in 2011, and so we went around and picked certain sites, and just like house tours, we actually had garden tours with the focus on gardening for rain, basically. How do you, you garden so that you are capturing a lot of water in a lovely, in a lovely way? And so that was the, the theme of our, our eco tour. And you can see um, in Second Street now, the, uh, there's an organization called Green Partners. And uh, one of the, the co-founders, I believe, of that organization lives in this house on Second Street Media. And she started digging up the little area between the sidewalk and the street. <laughs> I don't know if, how, if that's actually legal. I probably shouldn't say. I, I won't tell you what her address is, but anyway, um, it's so interesting because that's how things change. She was, she, people saw that, and now you walk through media, and everybody's digging up that part. I mean, it, they're planting tomatoes, they've got herbs. It's just fascinating to see how one person, may, you know, really sort of started something. Um, so, again, um, one person, one homeowner, you, if you come up with a great plan and your neighbor sees it, chances are they may make a slight change on their property and then gradually once you start, it, it, there is a snowballing effect. In Seattle, um, ho property owners were paying for stormwater. We haven't, we haven't gotten there yet, but Philadelphia is moving in that direction. And so that's, you know, the, the question is, ideally, each homeowner would be charged based on their property. That's often, that's kind of hard to do initially, so it's probably prorated looking at sort of an area. But eventually, that's, that may happen, and there are sort of runoff coefficients, and the, those coefficients are probably going to change over time. But, you know, obviously, uh, um, roofs are going to be different than lawns or vegetated areas. And Philadelphia Water Department is definitely starting to, to get people to start thinking about the cost of stormwater because they have to pay for that. And so they're breaking up now their bill. They're, they're sort of preparing uh, Philadelphians for what is all involved in their, in their rates. And you'll notice, you know, drinking water is $23 for their $63 bill, let's say, a month, and stormwater is $11 of that. So it's interesting how that's being broken down now so that the homeowner can see that. And then eventually, all the commercial enterprises are now paying for stormwater. Um, and, you know, when we buy, we, we buy bottled water and don't think anything of it, but if you think how expensive that is, and how expensive we're, you know, what we're paying for tap water. It's, it's very, very little. And they figured out with the new rates that they're proposing, it would be about 75 cents per day, which they say is like a third of a cup of coffee if you, you know, went out to buy it. And I, just to, sh to show you the different structure of the cost structure um, and how it's changed. Yeah, so here we have this sort of sp sprawled um, business um, and the the existing charge was five thousand, and now it's thirty thousand. So, but there's all kinds of initiatives. So if they start putting in pervious paving, if they start putting in a green roof, you know, then that their costs are going to be reduced tremendously. On the other hand, if you're vertical, <laughs> um, theirs went from fifty six thousand dollars to one thousand four hundred. I mean, that is amazing. They, and they didn't, if they put a green roof on that, they'll, they may not have to pay anything. So it's very interesting 
how we are definitely taking storm water into account because it's expensive. It costs the boroughs and the townships and the cities an enormous amount of water of, of money, um, and and of course they have to upgrade the treatment of that water. So, so if you go to phillywatersheds.org, there's a map actually, and I do have websites for you uh, at the end. And this shows you all these various pro um, projects that are going on, and they have images of them. So you can click on, if you're particularly interested in green roofs, you can click on that, and that will just show you where all the green roofs are in the city. If you're interested in everything, you, you, know, you can click on everything. So um, that is a wonderful resource. And so finally, I'm just going to show you this, just the before and after shot. So this is in, in Philadelphia. Um, in South Philly before and after, which I think is really lovely. So here they had this concrete, and I guess they had to get rid of at least that center. They built, could have built up along the sides, um, but um, I'm not sure what they did underneath for that pathway, but it's obviously very lovely. And again, just the walls, you know, putting, plant, putting plants out, putting planters out. They're, it seems so small, but again, every little bit makes a huge difference. So what can all of us do? Well, one is I would definitely encourage your township um, building to become a demonstration site. You've got this gorgeous building here, and I think it would be wonderful if, you ha if people could come here and actually see ways that, you know, changes they can make in their own property and have this as an example. Um, reassess your own property, kind of think about how you might redesign it. Um, the environmental advisory councils are wonderful organizations to work with. The conservancies are wonderful organizations to work with um, for various programs. Um, rain, I know there are a couple of rain barrel projects that are in the works um, here, which is great. Uh, if you get an arts organization to get involved, that's wonderful. Again, I would just encourage larger rather than smaller barrels. Um, there are also different media. It doesn't have to be paint. You, can, you know, you can think about. Uh, I was really happy with that that uh, signage material. And encur encourage your gardening club to create a rain gar garden or to help maintain it. So there are lots of different organizations that can you can partner with. So I thank you. This is our new building at the Stroud Water Research Center. Our old building is gorgeous, and people would, every time they came, would, would be am amazed by it. Stroud Water Research Center, by the way, is in Chester County. It's about 10 minutes from Longwood Gardens. And um, this, we have, you know, we have a green roof and solar paneling, and we don't have LEED certification yet. But we're, um, we're, we should be getting it soon. We're hoping we'll get platinum, which is the highest which um, is leadership in energy and environmental design, something like that. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful building, and beautiful inside. Um, and we have geothermal, and we have geothermal in the old building as well. So I hope you might all sometime come out and take a look at, look at that. So here are some websites. Your, the first is your township website. I, you know, I wanted to get a feel for kind of what's happening here and what Radnor Township and, and your maps look like, and um, it's all there. So that's a, it's a, there's lots of resources right on your township website. phillywatersheds.org is a great website to go to. Lots of good photos of some of these various projects. And then there's also wonderful photographs of our new center if you go to the Stroud Water Research Center website. Thank you. And so, <laughs> so I will take some questions if anybody has questions. If you do have questions, answer. please, uh, we have a handheld microphone. Please come up here. This is being taped for uh, television later. Sure. Well, if people come up here, they will be caught on camera. If they don't want to be caught on camera, then we can just hand them the microphone. Uh, I, uh, I'm a member of the board of the Radnor Conservancy, and as such, I'd like to invite all the people here 
and the people who are watching this program uh, to go on an eco tour with the Radnor Conservancy this May. So I'll definitely be talking to you. And secondly, I have a question. Um, our township, of course, is very much involved in what's happening with the water situation. But I wonder, as a, as a member of this community, what kinds of ordinances, or what kinds of um, smaller things can a township itself encourage the, uh, give incentives to people that live here to do things, small things, as you're talking, rain gardens, rain barrels. Are there things that other townships do that encourage this? Um, in terms of ordinances, um, there, are, there are lots of examples of ordinances that you could take a look at. Um, and I don't, I, I, you know, I, it seems to me that the thing that makes the biggest difference in terms of action, because a lot of times ordinances, unless somebody's really doing something that's causing enormous problems, if some, one neighbor is, is causing another neighbor to, you know, flood their house, ordinances tend to get put on the books, and then I don't, you know, I know how many people here read the ordinances on a regular basis. So that's where I say, I think if you individually do something in your, your garden or your yard that, that or, or to, through these various organizations like the Conservancy and then showcase certain things, then gradually the more people will start imitating that. And I think that's how change really seems to happen. Um, so, and if, as far as messy, I mean, the other thing is, it's sort of the way we look at the landscape. If I see a perfectly manicured yard and all the grass looks exactly the same, you know, a lot of what people would say, oh, that is just gorgeous. And it just, I just think, oh, that's horrible. They're probably using Kemlon or they're probably, you know, I mean, I just see it differently because of my background and what I know. So we, it's, it's more than, you know, sort of the, the physical needs, yes, we have to deal with stormwater, but it's also cultural, you know, how do we look at the landscape and, and kind of rethink what is beautiful? And I always think signage is important. So if you have a lot of wild flowers, you know, and they're going to seed on the side of your yard and people are thinking, oh my goodness, you know, you're worried about those neighbors who sort of have the Kemlon lawn and what a mess and they're cutting all their hedges and you know, everything is very, very neat. Put a sign there, you know, say, make it look purposeful, you know. Um, I think that, I, I always encourage that. Anyone else? Any other questions? Um, hi, I, I just wondered if you'd want to mention the wastewater treatment system at Stroud, just because it's very cool and innovative. Um, so uh, eventually we're hoping to, to actually use every bit of, of water that's coming off of our roof. Right now we have wetlands, various kind of wetland systems that are taking water and it's, it's going through these various systems um, and being treated. And again, we are imitating basically what happens when, you know, you're sort of the, the forest exists when you have these sort of natural systems of cleaning. And even within streams, they can clean themselves if they're protected. So we have, and again, I invite you to go to our website because I'm hoping, I think there's a, a nice description of that. So we're capturing, we're, we're capturing rain in a big rain barrel, but we also have a cistern in our basement. And we're hoping sometime, not we don't have it yet, but we are hoping to actually be drinking the water that is raining on, our, you know, on that building. So we are capturing right now as much of it as we can. Our toilets are, we have composting toilets. Um, so again, we are, I don't know if you're looking for, you know, any super specific, but my, I think the best way to understand that is actually to go to our website because there's a description of, you know, of the phases of it. Um, and if you, I don't have images right now on here, so I can't show you the system, but if you'd ever like to have a, a program, I can take you on all the different, um, kind of best management practices that are occurring right now at our, at our center, because it really is pretty amazing. I should say that the John Hines Wildlife Refuge was one of the first 
in our area that actually started some of those systems. They were one of the first that had rain barrels and they, they have a wetland system where they're actually cleaning some of their water and using it for wastewater. So right now we're using some of that water you know, for, for wastewater, but not for drinking water yet. But we're hoping to do that. So it's uh, clear that this presentation is geared towards homeowners and what the homeowner can do in small, small projects. And it seems like through the use of rain barrels and rain guards, we can treat a good portion of, uh, of our runoff right, on, on the residential property. Can you just speak briefly to um, what a, a large parking lot, um, they obviously not, they're not going to be using rain barrels on that parking lot, and well, at least not on, a, on an asphalt parking lot without a roof. Um, can you just uh, speak briefly to some of the interesting things that are, that are happening these days with the in well, innovative, but, innovative treatment of Yeah, of if you all surface. bring a jackhammer and at night you can <laughs> you go to the parking lot, they'll have to create a new parking lot. And then they can use all these wonderful new, um, no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's the, certainly, you know, that's, if you have a brand new parking lot, you're kind of stuck with, you know, impervious surfaces. So then you kind of look at that parking lot and you say, are there any areas around that? where you could, you know, where, the first thing to look at is where is the water going? Where is it draining? And from that, you know, I mean, you can, you can start planting and vegetation. There are underground, depending on how much money there is to, you know, that's always the big issue. You know, there's all kinds of underground systems where that water can get funneled and then spread out. That's what Philadelphia is doing when they have these trenches and bump outs, what they call them. I didn't go into that that much because this was geared towards homeowners. But one of the things in Philadelphia they're doing is they're actually creating these strips. They're actually kind of bumping out, you know, an area in the street in certain areas. And there, you see plants, and it doesn't look all that impressive. It's not that huge of an area, but there's a whole system underground. So when water runs off down the street, it actually goes into a system that, that you know, feeds those plants. But there's, like, again, the soil structure. And we keep going back to very simple kind of basic, you know, you, you need the sponge of some sort. So you, if you can create that sponge somewhere, it doesn't even have to be visible. And of course, most of the time it isn't visible. So in Philadelphia, again, a lot of these, the tree trenches, a lot of these things, you know, they don't look like huge, impressive projects from the, you know, the top of the ground. But there's, it's a very expensive, all kinds of stuff underground that's dealing with getting that water into the ground. So it, it would need an engineer to look at the, you know, at this point. And then some, when that cra first crack occurs, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's when you start saying, okay, now, before we try to, you know, move on, what can we do, at least with this area, and change it? And more, and this is, you know, more and more products are now going to be on the market, and it's going to get less and less expensive. So I think it is definitely moving in the right direction. This is another parking lot question. Um, we ha I live in a condo, and very soon we are going to have to replace our driveway. And that's a long driveway and a big parking lot. Um, and it's expensive just to put asphalt down. But what can we do, one, to make it less, well, more pervious? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, um, does the township offer, if we do something fantastic, does the township offer any uh, reduction in taxes or something? It would be lovely, mm -hmm. um, and you could suggest it to, <laughs> to your council members. Um, yeah. I would definitely, you know, that's any incentive that can get people to, you know, spend money to do this sort of thing. Or if you can get a number of people in your neighborhood who may have the same problem, you might be able to get a great price if enough, you know, so sometimes people pool, you know, mm -hmm. together and actually get somebody to do several driveways. 
So I mean, there are, right now, pervious paving, actually, I haven't had a whole lot of luck with finding a lot of companies that are doing that. I actually was trying, mm -hmm. because I, I was hoping, I'm, I'm on the Environmental Advisory Council media, and we have been working on our borough to have it as a site for demonstration. So we have two little rain gardens, we have the rain barrels. The next thing I'd like to see is pervious paving. Yeah. But um, I, I know that T Tyler Arboretum is putting in a um, pervious path, and they gave me some, you know, but, but again, that's a, lot, that's a big project. Um, and I'm trying to think there was, uh, and I can't think right Chanticleer, okay, has it in the native, native garden. And I think Penny Pack, um, they're yeah, nature centered. Nice. I know their parking lot, and of course, Villanova University parking lots have, have pervious asphalt. So there hmm. are people out there that are doing it, but I'm having, I've, I have had trouble, you know, kind of pinning down how much is it going to cost per square foot. And that may be a site to site kind of thing, mm -hmm. but it would be nice. One of the things I'd love to see on our website and media, and it'd be great to add to yours, is those practical kinds of things. Who, you know, who do you go to? Yeah. And that might be a problem in terms of identifying companies. I don't know. But getting a cost, you know, some idea of, of who's even doing this sort of thing and what the cost might mm -hmm. be. And I've, I've, I've run into some problems with So it's hard to find, that. it's hard to find who does this. I just, I haven't, and I haven't spent tons mm -hmm. of time on, because yeah. this was, you know, kind of um, <laughs> um, in bits and pieces of time that I had to try to find that out. But if it's a great project for any conservancy and EAC, so if someone, I mean, that's the next thing. Those, any kind of pervious paving, there are blocks that have openings in them for, you know, so if your car is going over, and I've seen a lot of that, actually. I was just out in Bend, Oregon, and there are a number, there's a, the Deschutes River goes right through that town, and there are a lot of driveways of properties that are near the river, and they're all, and they're also going towards their house, so I guess they need it, they want to make sure that water gets into the ground. And they have, you know, there was that picture, I don't know if you saw that, where you can probably get, that doesn't look that complicated. But again, for your slope, for, you know, you might need somebody to, to take a look at that and see what would work. Any other questions? Well, Vivian, I want to thank you. You've given us some great ideas, and uh, I look forward to working with the EAC and the township, and maybe we can uh, work on some of these demonstration uh, projects that you've, you've outlined for us. And I know uh, we have some of the projects underway. I, I know that we have a rain barrel project in Garrett Hill that's uh, been very successful, and we need to extend that, uh, Sarah and Paul, to other parts of the township. But thank you all for coming. <laughs>